Welcome. I'm John Jolly, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about Werewolf, the cluster configuration system that was recently packaged for uh, a factory so that we can provide more HPC functionality for our customers. So some of the things we're going to talk about, Werewolf. Um, we're going to talk mostly about what it is, how it's configured, how you can actually implement it. Now, one of the things, one of the topics that uh, was listed on the agenda was the Moonshot system. It's something that we have within house and we've been trying to tweak. Um, we'll discuss why it's probably not the best solution for HPC in general and some of the some of the failings I had with it. So you're not going to get as n nearly as much Moonshot as you're going to get of Werewolf, but then I think Werewolf's the better part of it anyway. So, what is Werewolf? Well, Werewolf actually consists of several uh, components. Werewolf's base component, or the common layer, is actually a set of Perl scripts that are used to manage a common database interface. Um, there is several objects that are stored within this database that represent various components within a typical cluster, such as nodes, uh, such as file systems, bootstraps, etc. We'll talk more about that as we go along. Uh, one of the things the common interface or the common layer provides is an initialization script, which the modules can actually provide functionality to in order to provide sanity checks, to initialize objects as necessary, whatever whatever's required for that particular module. Um, and it's actually fairly comprehensive. Um, most everything within Werewolf is controlled through a shell script called WWSH. And trust me, it is very difficult to type just two W's whenever you're trying to accomplish tasks on the system. Now, one of the primary modules within uh, the Werewolf system is, a, is called the cluster module. Its purpose is just simply to provide master and node functionality. So there are files that are installed within the node that allow it to communicate to the master and provide information. And the master also uh, provides uh, functionality, such as you can add users not just to a single system, but to the entire cluster by using the wwuser-add, which manipulates several files within the system to make it so that a user exists in the entire cluster. The provision module is probably where most of the work happens within the Werewolf system. Uh, the provision system actually assigns to the various nodes that you define resources that will allow the node to accomplish what it needs to. Things such as a bootstrap, a file system, etc. We'll talk more about that as we go along with uh, into it. One of the things provision does, the provision module does to perform this action, is it actually manages an Apache server, a DHCPD server, a TFTP server, to take care of the entire Pixie Boot landscape uh, for the cluster. So when you make a change within the master node, say you create a node or you do some provisioning, all of those changes get propagated to the correct service and the magic happens. So, Werewolf builds upon a file system, a network file system that is called, that is called the Virtual Node File System, VNFS. Um, it's a network mountable file system that basically is used for the Chirrut environments that the nodes will work off of. So, when you boot a node, there's actually a small bootstrap that starts up first, and VNFS actually takes care, uh, the VNFS module takes care of the bootstrap as well. But after the bootstrap is complete, it will have mounted this VNFS file system, either copied the data from it to uh, a RAM disk or actually uh, store it into the uh, whatever storage you may have on the node, if you have a storage on that node. Anyway, it's, it's primarily used just simply for very fast node-to-node -node 
communications. Now you can use other file systems. Don't, don't have to, you're not restricted to VNFS, but Werewolf uses it to its most efficient abilities. All right, so those are the major modules that we have with, the, um, with Werewolf. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Moonshot. Now, the Moonshot system is actually a very interesting rack-based system. It's tightly packed with 45 uh, individual systems, uh, all within a uh, 4.3U uh, rack mount system, along with two switches and power supply and everything else that goes along with it. Now, the, the one we have uh, right now actually, um, ooh, that's kind of crooked, sorry about that, but that's the one we have in Provo. Uh, we actually have one in Nuremberg as well, as far as I understand. That's, this one's Intel-based. The one in Nuremberg is ARM-based, but same basic configuration. Um, it has a switch. As um, the thing has two switches, one of the switches in the Provo site is uh, bricked. Not certain why it came that way, but I believe somebody screwed up the firmware update. At least one switch works. And what's really nice is those. Um, uh, oh, I'm talking, this is actually not about the switch. This is, um, this is what works on the system. So the, um, I'll just keep talking about the switch. The switch actually allows for VLANs, a fairly comprehensive configuration of the entire network infrastructure. You can break up the nodes into lots of different little VLANs. You can isolate whatever needs to happen to make it work. And it works really great um, with a werewolf system if you can get the configuration just right, which is one of the problems you have with this is one configuration setting off and the entire system is, is a mess. So, but one of the things I really liked about the, uh, the whole setup was you could actually run one command on several of the nodes, get lots of work done, power up, power down. Um, it was actually quite entertaining to have 44 nodes powering up all at once uh, with just one command. Anyway, um, the, probably the worst thing about the whole Moonshot system is it's Pixie Boot. If you don't get the Pixie Boot configuration right, your nodes look horrible. They just simply, the speed is uh, at 96, um, 9600 which means that most setups, which default to 115200, um, just simply break. It doesn't, nothing shows up. I'm showing you a sample Moonshot Pixie, B, uh, Pixie Boot screen there with way too much text as it is. Usually it comes across as nothing at all and you wait, for, wait to see if anything's gonna happen. Um, anyway, and it says that it supports IPMI, but brother, if I could make that work properly, there were features missing, there were features that didn't do the right thing, so IPMI just simply isn't a thing. So guess what? That's all I'm gonna talk about Moonshot. The rest of this is just about Werewolf. So let's talk about a Werewolf installation. So the Werewolf system because this is a relatively new package, we actu I'm actually installing from one of my development systems. There's four packages, bare minimum, that you need to, to get this running. Uh, the provision and the provision server, VNFS and the cluster packages. They are available right now um, within uh, the open build service in my development repository. They have been submitted to factory. We're still waiting for approval on that. Now, the first thing that needs to happen to make Werewolf work is you need to tell Werewolf which interface is going to be used for the cluster. Most Werewolf masters will have two interfaces. Your outward facing interface, the one that you will remote into, the one that may be connected to the internet, has all the package uh, repositories and such, and then a second interface that will be isolated for just the nodes. So that is really the one setting you need to set in Werewolf. Now, mind you, right now, the package actually has a bug where you need to do a second setting, but that's within the DHCP settings where you set the outbound, or the, the internal, I mean, the internal facing uh, interface. But once you've made those, those changes, you're ready to run. So the first thing you do whenever you uh, want to get the werewolf system up is you run ww init all. 
This actually goes through a rather extensive initialization process where it creates the database, um, it sets up nodes, it builds a bootstrap for you, it'll even build the VNFS uh, file system for you if you have it configured to do so. By default, it doesn't. Usually building a file system is something that's a more personal experience. Most people don't just simply want some default file system created. Who knows what you're gonna get? <clears throat> So once you've performed the, the actual initialization, your Royal Wolf cl cluster is ready to go. All you need to do now is provision, or create the nodes, and provision the nodes. This tends to be a little bit complicated, but there are some tools that make it significantly easy. And I knew it was gonna do that. There we go. Sorry, Adam Spear created a very wonderful set of uh, SUSE presentation slides that you can do with Markdown, but I'm still trying to get the hang of it. I might have some bugs to fix as well. So the first step that you want to do after you've created, you, after you've initialized um, the werewolf system is create a bootstrap image. Now, WW and it all will create one, but I put this in here for your benefit so that you understand what goes on under the hood. And in fact, I would frequently recreate bootstraps whenever I would modify the um, init, uh, the init RAM FS that uh, the bootstrap is built off of. But really, the bootstrap consists of two things, the operating system kernel, and the an init ram uh, rf init ram fs that is created during build time so there's not a lot of modification that can happen to that bootstrap the init ram fs actually contains busybox a few extra tools like parted and makefs and uh, i put them up here bsd tar um, I'm sure that's a personal preference. I'm sure we can mo modify that if necessary, but uh, that's the way it is. Anyway, these are the bare, nece uh, bare necessities for actually getting Werewolf started on a system. I'll talk more about the boot process and how the uh, bootstrap image actually integrates with the rest of the boot process. But you do need to create a bootstrap image. Most bootstrap images just simply have the same name as the current running kernel on your system. That's what Bootstrap is going to pull from, although you can specify other kernels to create Bootstrap from. The next step is to create what is called the Chirrut file system. This is the file system that the node will use to actually run whatever projects you're running on, whatever tools you need to have installed. There's a tool I have it shown up here, called WWMKChirrut. That tool actually goes through the process of establishing all the files necessary for your Chirrut environment, installing all the packages, and just generally getting it configured and ready to run. Now, the thing is about the Chirrut environment is it's easily modifiable. At this point, it's just an open file system. You can go through add packages as necessary, make configuration changes. What you're doing is you're setting up what the final node boot system is going to look like. Now, this Trude environment will either be a RAM file system, if you want a stateless environment, or it will be, you can actually install it into a storage device on the node. Uh, most high-performance computing centers obviously aren't going to put a whole heck of a lot of money into storage on each of the nodes. When you've got 100,000 nodes you're dealing with, storage can get really expensive that way. All you're wanting is a CPU and memory, and so most times you'll run a stateless environment. Now, after you've created the Chirrut environment, you need to package it up, if you will, into what is called the VNFS file image. This is done with the uh, WWVNFS tool right here. And it's just simply making sure that all the files are in one place and that it is properly registered with 
the werewolf uh, cluster system. This means that it gets that the information about the file system gets placed into the database, not the file system itself, obviously. The file system itself actually gets put into a directory so it can be served by Apache or a web server. To, uh, Apache is the default for werewolf, so that that particular VNFS can be loaded by the node as necessary. So once we've got the file systems created, we can create a node. Node creation is real simple. All that's necessary to create a node in Werewolf is to know what is the hardware MAC address for the device and what IP address do you need. Now you can define other things such as what is the net device that comes up when you boot the system. There's lots of parameters that you can actually define for a node, but bare minimum is just the MAC address and the IP address. Now this just simply defines the node and sets it up within the DHCPD server so that the node knows what to come up with whenever it, whenever it boots. So once you've created the node and once you've got the file system and the boot, uh, boot image, you can provision those file system and boot images to one or more nodes uh, using the www-shell provision command. Provision takes all this information, combines it so that when the werewolf, uh, when the system boots up, it knows which particular boot image to use for that particular node, um, and then eventually the right uh, VNFS. It actually allows for stateless as well as stateful, so if you add a parameter to this, you can actually specify how you want that image to be deployed onto the particular node, uh, how you want it partitioned. There's actually a script uh, language that Werewolf has created that allows you to specify commands such as create partitions in this manner, format the file systems in this manner, so that whenever you install the uh, VNFS, all the, subs uh, the subsystems are put in properly. Now, one of the things Werewolf does very nicely is it allows for the use of configurable files that are overlaid on top of the, uh, the, w the VNFS file system. Things such as password files, if you want to be able to have users to use the common uh, uh, password file across all the nodes. The earlier command that I showed you in the cluster module that allows you to add user actually creates a file for password and for group. It doesn't do it for shadow, and I'm really not certain why, but I suspect I'm going to have to fix that particular problem. In any case, you can do more than just that. You can put munge master keys in there. You can put host files so that every, every uh, node knows exactly where to find host. You don't have to set up special DNSs to make it work. Um, and, and what happens is you import this file using the file import command, and then you provision the file into um, that particular node. And you can do it for multiple nodes. The um, actual node selection that's right here. So I'm just doing for one node here, but you could do it for a range of nodes and have that file deployed. One of the nice things about this, uh, this file, uh, file deployment is you can actually set dynamic parameters within the file. There's shell script-like uh, variables that you can put that will allow that file to be deployed with specific configurable values. So it's not just simply a static file. It's actually dynamic. So with all that, you just boot the node. Um, Everything's set up and ready to go. Let me explain a little bit about the boot process, and then I'll go ahead and demonstrate that boot process for you. The first thing that happens is, of course, Pixie Boot tries to contact a TFTP server, and the first thing that's downloaded is iPixie. So not only do, do the machines get to Pixie Boot, but they also get to iPixie Boot. Um, mostly this is because iPixie has additional functionality, specifically the Apache uh, downloadability. 
So once the iPixie is downloaded and again recontacts the server, it's able to download things such as the bootstrap uh, to get it started up. And once the bootstrap is up, the bootstrap actually takes care of a lot of the busy work, uh, such as making sure all the files are, all the configuration files look correct, the node name is correct, etc., cetera, uh, setting the IP address if necessary, any parameters that have been set for that specific node, as well as opening the VNFS, copying it to a RAM file, uh, uh, into a RAM storage, or to, and this is where the stateful pr provisioning would happen as well. So, um, this is basically, th this is how Werewolf works. And so let me show you, I've got a system set up. I wasn't about to go through all the effort of creating a, um, <laughs> let's see here, we're gonna go ahead and, So the first thing I'm going to do is drag this over here so that you can watch. Of course, this is completely dependent on whether or not I, there we go. Ah. All right. Always a problem in the details. So let me just do this. So what I have on this particular system, for your information, is a um, virtual machine. Yeah, it's too small, isn't it? A little bit better? All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to first uh, kill off my running node. Ah. I forget. All right. Oh, <laughs> I named it different. That's why. So, verse destroy tw node zero one. Okay. So, I'm going to go ahead and start up with console my node. Now, whenever it starts up, of course, it does a regular Pixie boot. But you'll notice that it's, it briefly shows you after after it gets. This is the actual um, tumbleweed boot screen. So you can see it's loading drivers. You can load specific drivers for that particular bootstrap if you have particular hardware. Um, gets the uh, VNFS, and there it is. It's booted a stateless node. So this is gener this is basically how Werewolf works. Do I have any questions? Yes. Yeah, a couple of questions. Because I, I did this stuff for a living, so to speak, for HP like 10 years ago. Okay. Oh, oh true. Ah. It's good that everyone has heard. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. Is it working? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Anyhow, like I was saying, I did this stuff for a long time for HP, so I've got kind of like a biased perspective on, on booting large clusters and things. And a couple questions come to mind, one of which is when you were specifying MAC addresses, did that mean that you had to like run around to each machine and look up the MAC addresses? And Because I know that was a big problem for us, and what we ended up doing was writing a utility that queried all the ILOs and got the and, and dynamically calculated figured out figured out all that stuff without any manual intervention. So to answer that question, yes, Werewolf has experienced your pain, they figured that one out. Cool. Uh, they actually do have a script that will create the node definitions for you exactly as you specified. 
by what what um, what contacts are made to the DHCP t uh, D server to request an address. It records the MAC address out of it, creates a node, and goes from there. So yes, that so that's that script. So the DHCP server then has to have the MAC addresses. Well, it, the the DHCP is logging the MAC addresses as they come in. So then and you don't necessarily know which machine that MAC address is associated with, just that it's associated no, with a machine. No. In, in, most, in most HPC cluster systems, mm -hmm. one node is pretty much the same as every other node. Well, I, in, in most cases. Yeah, they, well, well, that was my next question. Because like on the, on the HPC clusters that we built, we would have specific services for specific nodes. Mm -hmm. So like on a thousand node cluster, you might have 950 of them actually doing the work, but you might have 10 of them set up as a Lustre file system, five of them set up as an NFS, ex, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you'd have to be able to know which machines you were targeting your images to so that when you installed them, they landed in the right place. Correct, correct. Um, so do we have a second microphone? <laughs> oh, hang on. Well, this werewolf stuff is strictly for setting up the nodes, or the compute nodes. So you would probably set up everything else um, uh, before this, so your your management servers uh, and and your Lustre file system, and only use this to set up the, the compute nodes. One last question, and that's parallelism. I'm assuming you can boot nodes in parallel. And, yes, and, yes, it can. And how how efficient is it? So that's a good question. Um, I'm not exactly certain how efficient it is. Uh, I know that you can set up multiple uh, werewolf masters to accomplish uh, the same basic tasks. So, okay, just, as a number, just to, to take home and think about, we used to be able to boot a 2,000 node cluster in like 25 minutes. That's pretty Which good. That's images. pretty good. I, I, I can tell you, I can tell you honestly, yeah. the werewolf system doesn't nearly have that kind of performance. Yeah, but, but mind you, I'm, I'm running. One werewolf master on this poor little two uh, two core atom processor. No, I, I, I totally get, no so. the, I guess the real the real thing the slide the slide that would have been helpful at the beginning, but maybe it's a different topic. Right. Is what is your target environment? If you're looking to support hundred node clusters, then all you got to do is image a hundred node cluster. If you want right. to support a ten thousand node cluster, it's a whole different set of problems. So realize that yeah. werewolf is being used by um, a lot of different uh, uh, high performance clusters. Uh, I know that uh, Los Alamos National Laboratories uses it. Lawrence Berkeley uses it. Um, Oak Ridge, I've, I've heard, uses it. Um, so it's actually fairly common in a lot of the really big HPC clusters. A lot of these clusters are specifically using RDMA. And so what they'll do is they'll actually have InfiniBand or Rocky adapter drivers in the bootstrap. And during the bootstrap process, instead of just simply going over basic ethernet, they're actually using high bandwidth uh, fabric to perform the node deployments. Yeah, that, 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 was my, that was kind of sort of my other question was in, in addition to installing the operating system when you build your boot image, presumably you can install additional drivers or applications That's correct. or That's libraries, correct. et cetera, et cetera. The, the make Chroot um, actually uses a file that has all the packages listed that you want to install. If you want to add more packages to it, throw more packages cool. into it. Cool. Or you can install them manually after the make Chroot is done and do whatever configuration is necessary to make it work. Cool. Cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Any, qu any other questions? Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any other questions about Werewolf or HPC, feel free to approach me during the conference. I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you.